Almost two years ago now, I released a video on curses as disability in fiction, where part of what I talked about was Ida the Owl Lady from the Owl House. The Owl House has now wrapped, so I figured, what better time to do a video on the show as a whole and how they handle physical disability and neurodivergence. But first, I want to give a massive thanks to this video's sponsor. The first sponsorship I've accepted on this channel. As someone who frequently tweaks my TTRPG characters so I can play someone like myself in a fantasy setting, I am thrilled to announce that this video is sponsored by Limitless Champions. Limitless Champions by Wormworks Publishing is the largest and most diverse collection of disability-themed fantasy miniatures ever created. Their Kickstarter campaign is running from the 2nd of May to the 1st of June, with a base goal of 10,000 US dollars. Limitless Champions includes some favorites from their 2022 release, Limitless Heroics, including characters with disabilities, mental illness, and neurodivergence in 5th edition, and adds new exclusive characters represented through visible physical traits, assistive items, and service animals. The collection also includes condition marker bases accessible to blind gamers with recognizable shapes and braille labels. In addition to full-color tarot-sized cards and a full-color electronic book of character descriptions in multiple accessible formats, Backers can choose STL files for 3D printing or resin miniatures. The campaign also offers a padded wooden chest with a choice of cover art. Stretch goals include digital planner stickers and tokens for use in virtual tabletops, and additional miniatures representing fantasy service animals. So go to oakworm.inclusiverpg.com to support the Kickstarter and, as a bonus, you'll be supporting this channel. Again, that's oakworm.inclusiverpg.com. And thank you so much to Limitless Champions for sponsoring this video. Anyway, back to your regularly scheduled programming. So, the Owl House is done. After a much shorter third season than they were due, because Disney had to go and be... Disney about it. But the fact remains. The show has said its goodbyes, the characters have taken their bows, and now we are left with a complete product to look back on and discuss. Which I have been wanting to do for ages. I didn't want to do a video on disability in the Owl House before the show ended, but now that I have a full show to comb through, I am rearing to go. The Owl House, if you for some reason don't know, is a show following primarily the adventures of a human girl named Luz Noceda, who finds her way into the demon realm and into the care of a witch by the name of Edelyn Clawthorn, more commonly known as Ida the Owl Lady. There are a whole bunch of directions I could approach this from, honestly, but for this video I want to talk about Luz's obvious neurodivergence, some other observations about disability in the show, and then focus on Ida and her curse. So, let's dig in, because Dana Terrace and the Owl House crew fed us well. First, let's tackle the topic of Luce's obvious neurodivergence. She fidgets, hyperfocuses, and her attention habitually wanders. She's deeply into a few select things and throws herself into knowing them inside and out. She has trouble reining herself in to a level acceptable by the rest of society. This is not a neurotypical person. I appreciate this for a lot of reasons. Firstly, because she's the main character, and her ND traits aren't treated as character flaws. They get in her way sometimes, sure, but they're not inherently bad. She cares deeply about those around her, is passionate, fun, and incredibly smart. She struggles in areas that don't interest her, and in an effort to make them more interesting to her, she gets in trouble. At least in the human realm. I also appreciate this because Luce is a girl. 
And while ADHD is more commonly diagnosed in women than, say, autism, it's still severely underdiagnosed. So it's nice to see a young girl with what I read as pretty obvious ADHD on screen. Dana Terrace did confirm that she envisioned Luce as neurodivergent when she first wrote her, so we even have the creator's seal of approval on this one. Given the show's general theme of us weirdos have to stick together, it would be pretty weird if we didn't, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Luce also definitely isn't the only ND character in the show. There are so many that could read as ND in a variety of different ways. Lilith, Gus, and Hunter are all popularly headcanoned as autistic, for example, and Gus's childhood struggle with anxiety is a pretty central part of one of the later episodes in Season 2. Suffice it to say, while we never get any named diagnoses, the show is practically crawling with neurodivergent people whose ND traits are treated as simply part of them. And when it comes to things like Gus's anxiety, or Hunter's pretty explainable trauma, they have characters lead each other through breathing exercises on screen, and this makes me a little more emotional than I think it should, but there you have it. In a show like The Owl House on a world like The Boiling Isles, it's not exactly surprising that we run into a handful of physically disabled characters as well. The only slight note I have is that of the ones we see, all of them seem to be acquired disabilities. But even with that, the show does a couple neat things. It absolutely didn't have to, but did anyway. Because it could. I'm speaking specifically of Principal Hieronymus Bump, of Hexide School of Magic and Demonics. In this case, when we first encounter him, we don't really give his appearance a second thought. The Boiling Isles has already shown itself to be such a wild place that Bump doesn't even really register in the realm of out there designs. It's just, okay, he has a demon hat, and we move on with our days. I didn't see many people even question why we'd never seen his palisman until the sixth episode of the second season when he reveals that that demon hat is his palisman. Free one here helps me see. This is a delightful reminder that you never know what's going on with someone unless and until they tell you. Bump is blind in his left eye, and judging by the scar cutting across his right, I don't think it's too out there to imagine that his vision in his right eye is impacted as well. Not so much as to make it impossible for him to fly or fight when Frewin is in staff form, but enough to make it so that having Frewin rest on his head for the vast majority of the time is, I would assume, a boon to his quality of life. Whatever it is that happened to make this necessary, it happened when he was pretty young too, because the earliest photo we have of Bump shows him with Frewin already acting as his eyes, this being back in his Hexide days, when he was around the age our main cast is during the series. Then there's Ida's father, Del Clawthorn. He is similarly blind in one eye and has a persistent tremor in one hand due to nerve damage sustained when he accidentally triggered the Owl Beast back when Ida was still new to being cursed, and no one knew how to navigate around her curse yet. Ida naturally feels horrible about this, but Del, being a good father and person, is more worried about his daughter. He can't carve Palisman anymore, which was his profession prior to the accident, but he picked himself up and found a way to stay in a field similar enough where he could keep contact with his passion he began helping the Bat Queen replenish her forests of palestrum wood. I don't have a whole lot to say on him, because he's such a minor character, but I appreciate his inclusion regardless. He is a great example of someone who's sustained a career-ending injury and found new ways to continue working with his passion anyway. He found fulfillment, and in the epilogue, an apprentice in Hunter. Speaking of Hunter, I want to briefly touch on how this series handles facial scars and other facial differences. 
the first most obvious thing is this is the Boiling Isles. No amount of facial difference could possibly make you stand out or get ostracized in this society. Which leaves scarring. Here I'd like to focus on four examples. Dell, again, Hunter, Rain, and Bellos. What I find interesting is that, out of all of these examples, Bellos, our villain, is the only one whose facial scarring looks markedly unnatural. It's not even really scarring, as we learn later, it's hints of his true nature burning through the face he wears for appearances. The thing he's turned himself into over centuries of extending his life and absorbing the essence of Palisman. And the rest are all good people. Not despite or because of their scars, completely incidental to them. So far, the show's made a pretty good impression. So let's talk about Ida and how she stacks up with the rest of this. To begin with, perhaps I should establish why I view Ida's curse as a disability. It's really quite simple. It's a condition which greatly impacts her life, she has to take medication regularly to manage it, even with the medication it saps her energy and, once it's progressed far enough, makes her unable to cast magic in the way that is natural for people of her species. Also, it causes her body to literally fall apart sometimes. When we first meet her, we obviously don't know she's cursed. The show does a similar thing with her as it did with Bump, but with Ida there are a few extra layers to take into consideration. The first time Luce sees one of Ida's limbs fall off, she brushes it off later in that very same episode. When she gets her head chopped off, she also notably doesn't address it. It's brushed under the rug and not elaborated on. This is not a good thing. Because, unlike with Bump, Ida has people who don't know the details of her condition who live with her. Sure, you don't owe anyone your medical history, but there's nuance to everything. The people you live with, for example, need to know what's going on with you so they know what's going on and what to do if something happens to you. Even, possibly especially, if you're the primary caregiver. I get that discussing your disability with people who depend on you is probably a daunting task, but Luz and King need to know about Ida's curse so they know what to do if she starts getting feathery. It's practically a miracle something like The Intruder didn't happen earlier, given Ida has raised King since he was a baby. Obviously, King shouldn't have stolen Ida's potion in the first place, but the idea never even would have occurred to him if Ida had explained to him what it was for. Personally, I think this is a wonderfully nuanced take. Ida didn't want to scare her kid by telling him about her curse, but keeping it from him hurt them all in the long run. There are other examples in the show of situations where Ida's pride and her will to tough it through on her own have cost her. Primarily Rain, who broke up with her partially because she kept pushing them away and lying to them about how she was doing. Obviously, Ida didn't owe them anything in regards to her condition, but again, if you're going to be in a serious relationship with someone, you need to tell them about stuff like this or things are going to fall apart. As for that one time King used Ida's curse to benefit himself, it's realistic and it sucks. It happens more than you'd like to think. And it'd be a whole lot worse if he wasn't, you know, eight years old. And he learned his lesson in the end and everything was fine, so... Better learn early than never. As we all know, though, Ida is not the only one who gets cursed with this particular curse. At the end of Season 1, Lilith uses a spell to take on half of it herself to pull Ida back from being the Owl Beast forever. Which gives us a really neat comparison in the first part of the second season. We have Ida who's been chronically ill for years and has pretty much learned the ropes, 
and we have Lilith, who is new to it and still figuring out how to cope. Of course, Ida is justifiably salty at times in the wake of the reveal that Lilith was the one who cursed her in the first place, but she also cares enough about her sister not to leave her to founder on her own like Ida once did. It's also in this season that we meet Gwendolyn Clawthorn, Ida's anti-vaxxer mother. That might sound like a joke, but it's really not. <laughs> I went into a lot of my feelings about her in my previous video, but to summarize, she's unable to accept the fact that Ida's going to be cursed for the rest of her life, and she doesn't listen when her daughter tells her she's found ways to deal with it. Gwen has fallen down the rabbit hole of big pharma conspiracies and alternative medicine, and keeps trying to force a new cure on Ida, practically as an annual tradition to the point where she goes through her adult daughter's house in secret and confiscates every stash of potions she can find. Real r slash insane parents shit. This is, obviously, a really bad thing to do, and does not go well for anyone involved. Thankfully, by the end of the episode, Gwen's been forcefully confronted with the evidence of where her well-intentioned but extremely harmful path has led both herself and her daughters. One of them resents her, the other she has neglected to the point she didn't even know Lilith was cursed now too. And Gwen has opened herself up to scammers to the point where she's trading family heirlooms for phony cures. It's the fact that she actually does care about her daughters more than her own pride that allows her to see her own errors and make amends. Not everyone is so lucky, but I'm happy for the Clawthorn sisters, that while their mother may have been extremely misguided and certainly not the best, she cared enough to acknowledge that in the end. And this is where we were the last time I talked about Ida. Since then, there has, of course, been a rather significant development. Oh, girl, this is a hot look. Harpy Ida the state of equilibrium she reaches with the Owl Beast. After this development, I got a few asks from people concerned that this was the show pulling a disability cure in the vein of, if you just try hard enough, you won't be disabled anymore. Yeah, I'm gonna cut that off right there, that's not what this is. Ida coming to an understanding with the Owl Beast didn't uncurse her. She's still very much cursed. She still can't do magic in the way that's natural for her, her body's still prone to falling apart, and she can still have episodes, though naturally they're rarer and under more extreme circumstances. Most importantly, however, the only reason she was able to even get to this point is the potion. She found a medicine that works, and it's allowed her the space she needs to properly understand her condition and how she can best function with it. With this also comes the reveal that the Owl Beast isn't simply an effect of the curse. It was an actual animal that was captured and turned into a curse. This effectively makes the Owl Beast and Ida headmates in almost a DID sense. Retroactively, this could make the curse's initial introduction with the Owl Beast as something to repress and fear a bit iffy. But I think that's exactly why they kept this reveal until Ida herself understood it. Because the Owl Beast isn't something to repress and fear, and doing so only makes things worse. Moreover, all the times we've seen it hurt someone, has been for understandable reasons. It attacked Dell because he set up a sparkler that triggered its PTSD. In The Intruder, it eats the Snaggleback because it's hungry. And it doesn't actually know King and Luce, so I don't find it at all strange that it would be hostile to them. In Escape of the Palisman, the owl is perfectly content just munching on playground equipment until King kicks it, at which point it becomes hostile. In season one's finale, well, everything was basically going to hell in a handbasket all over the place. 
In Keeping Up Appearances, the owl and the raven fight each other because the raven is getting emotional bleed from Lilith, emerging in response to her stress and panic, and projecting her jealousy about Gwen paying more attention to Ida into hostility against the owl. After that, the next time we see the owl is when Ida's seen its history through its eyes and come to understand that it doesn't want this either. The owl didn't ask to be a curse, just like Ida didn't ask to be cursed. Later, in Eclipse Lake, we actually see Ida communicate with the owl in order to transform into Harpy Ida, and later learn that she agreed to eat some voles for it. They're cooperating. After this, the only time we ever see the owl take more full control is in extreme situations, like when the Collector took over the Boiling Isles, or when Ida thought Luce was dead. So to summarize, no, this is not a cure, and I don't want to be uncharitable, but I almost resent the people who thought it was. I get that you're coming from a place of concern, but getting a better understanding of her condition and her headmate improved Ida's quality of life. It didn't suddenly make her not disabled. Implying that it did reads very anti-recovery and anti-medication, seeing as it was only possible for them to get to this point because of the potions and presumably, if Ida stopped taking them, things would go to shit for her again. She's very much still cursed. She just understands her curse better now. Of course, at the end of Season 2, she also becomes an amputee. How, you may ask, when we've already established that her condition allows her to freely reattach her limbs when they fall off? In short, corrupted magic was crawling up her arm, rain ripped it off to save her life, arm disintegrated. There's a lot more to the story, obviously, but it's not really necessary to go over for the analysis. All we really need is the understanding that her arm was destroyed, therefore there was nothing to reattach. She spends pretty much all of Season 3 sporting a bandaged stump, which seemed to be Sans elbow. So you can imagine my confusion when, in the epilogue, she shows up wearing what looks like a simple hook prosthetic that seems fit for a transradial amputation instead. That is, an amputation that's between the wrist and the elbow somewhere. When I could have sworn that what actually happened was an elbow disarticulation, and nothing in Season 3 gave me any reason to doubt that assumption. I'm going to guess this was maybe a bit of an animation miscommunication. Maybe she had some of her lower arm left, but the actual joint of her elbow was damaged too badly for her to move it during the events of Season 3. Then, between that and the epilogue, was able to sort out her joint for her, and that's why she's apparently got joint articulation in her elbow, and what seems like a transradial prosthesis in the epilogue. Regardless, there seems to be a bit too much stump after her elbow to make sense, but maybe they were able to, I don't know, extend it with abomination goo, or some kind of magic replacement flesh so she could keep the actual joint? That's at least what I'm going to assume, so I don't drive myself nuts about it. As for the prosthetic itself, I actually really appreciate that it's a hook. Partially because, of course, Ida would go for a hook, but mostly because I've heard from several amputees who prefer hooks to cosmetic or robotic prosthetics, if they want a prosthetic at all. While Ida's hook is definitely fantasy-flavored, too sharp and too big, it's still a hook, which are, apparently, a lot more practical than almost anything else currently available on the market. And in the epilogue, we also got a glimpse of Harpy Lilith, confirming she and the Raven have reached the same level of understanding and communication as Ida and the Owl. Love that for them. All in all, the Owl House is a great showing when it comes to disability, both in its main characters and in its side characters. It did a fantastic job navigating a trope that can often be very hard to pull off, 
without coming off as some flavor of thoughtless at best, downright offensive at worst. In case I didn't make it clear through this entire video, I love this show dearly, and I hope we someday get a movie or some other continuation or further content. Honestly, there's still so much that could be done in this universe, and there's so much the crew had to cut because Disney had to go and shred their third season to a third of the length it deserved. Yes, I'm still salty about that. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye.